And uh, I'm here to announce this morning that, our, uh, that I'm also confident that our last speaker will keep up the pace. If you've had a chance to engage Paul Springer this weekend, uh, you learned that he is unpredictable, not to say outrageous, and full of joie de vivre. In fact, if you Google him, you'll discover that he is, by legend at least, an expert on extraterrestrial aliens, among other things. That's a little in-joke. You'll find out if you Google him. Paul Springer is uh, an associate professor of comparative military history at the Air Command and Staff College at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. He grew up in Iowa and, and Texas and has his B, uh, BA and PhD from Texas A&M University. Uh, he, he teaches courses on leadership, strategy, terrorism, and military history. And is the, he's the author of many, many books. Uh, I, I, I like to compare him to that uh, British historian, uh, Jeremy Black, who uh, has already published about 100 books. And I have a feeling that Springer is going to uh, go for that record, sort of like T Tiger Woods and Jack Nicholas. Um, he's the author already of America's Captives, Military Robots and Drones. Uh, he has a book in press, Transforming Civil War Prisons, Lincoln, Lieber, and the Laws of War, which I'm particularly interested in, uh, and uh, is uh, finishing up America's Wars, a Military History of the United States from 1500 to the present. He is the series editor of two exciting uh, uh, pr uh, productions by the Naval Institute Press, Transforming War and the History of Military Aviation. And his current research, this is just his current research, what he's working on now, include books on cyber warfare, military robotics, the West Point class of 1829, and higher education in the American South from 1865 to 1900. Uh, he has taught as well um, uh, at the uh, Texas A&M University and at the, universe, at the uh, United States Military Academy at West Point. His topic for us this morning is thinking about military history in the age of drones, hackers, and IEDs. Please welcome Paul Springer. Well, thank you, Walter, for that thoroughly undeserved uh, thoroughly undeserved introduction there. It was very kind of you. Uh, I am kind of individual that gets easily bored, which explains why I write about a lot of really unrelated subjects. Today they gave me a, a lecture topic that you could argue has some semi-unrelated subjects, and I'm going to see if I can bring it all together. Now, if there's any baseball fans in here, if you do a count, you will see that I'm the ninth speaker getting up here in front of you. That can go one of two ways. Either I'm the closer and I'm getting brought in to shut down the enemy, which I assume is you, or I'm the worst batter on the team, and they're kind of hoping I wouldn't come up to the plate at all. Uh, that, you know, bottom of the ninth, we'd already be ahead, it wouldn't matter. So be a judgment call what you think about the answer to that issue as we go forward. Now, because I work for the federal government, I must give you standard disclaimers. Everything I am about to tell you is probably not true, and if it is true, it's still not the view of the U.S. government or the Department of Defense or the Air Force or the Post Office or Air Command and Staff College or Air University or my colleagues and possibly myself. You are not allowed to record it or rebroadcast it without the express written permission of the National Football League. And if you do, you will get a sternly worded email. So having done it, see, that's all recorded now. So when the Public Affairs Office gets mad at me, as they do every time I do something like this, then I can just refer them back to the videotape that I presented that disclaimer and it's not my fault, uh, which hasn't worked yet, but it's going to work sooner or later. Okay, so bottom line up front, as far as I know, Alan, you're going to send out these slides or make them available to anybody that wants them. Therefore, you shouldn't try to copy all of this down. But the argument that I'm going to present for you today is that we are living right now in the midst of what is called a revolution in military affairs. And we'll get into exactly what an RMA is in just a moment. But it is my contention that this revolution in military affairs is transforming warfare. It is transforming military conflict. It is blurring the lines between the civilian and military worlds. And when you're at the beginning of a revolution in military affairs, you have a unique opportunity to shape how that change is going to be carried out. You have the chance to influence everybody else that adopts all of the changes that follow. 
I think the United States is in that position right now in regards to robotic and cyber warfare. And if we do the right things, we can have a tremendous influence, and I would argue we can actually humanize and modify the potential damage associated with warfare going forward. On the other hand, if we fail to act, or if we act in an incorrect fashion, we're just going to make warfare infinitely worse. Uh, life is about to get very complex from both a technological and a strategic and a doctrinal standpoint for the United States military and the U.S. government. So, the term re revolution in military affairs was first coined by a Soviet. Uh, all of my students in the Air Force are always convinced that I'm a closet communist. I'm not. I'm completely out of the closet. Here I am. The, the other half of them think I'm a fascist, so it really kind of goes one way or the other. Nikolai Orgakov coined the term to essentially say there are periods where one change, and it does not have to be technological, but it often is, has such great ramifications that those who adopt the change, those who conform to the new reality, have an enormous advantage over those that don't. And depending on which expert you ask, there might have only been a handful, or there might have been dozens of them. Everybody seems to have their own threshold for exactly what's revolutionary and what's evolutionary. But one of the ones that almost everybody can agree upon started about 700 years ago. Being a historian, you know, I gotta, I gotta back up as far as I can to really explain anything. Uh, and this is the, this is where the, the old joke comes from. How many historians does it take to change a light bulb? Anybody know the answer? The light bulb was invented in 1880. <laughs> Terrible joke. So, to explain this revolution in military affairs that everybody's going to be familiar with, I've got a great example here of what warfare looked like in the 14th and 15th centuries. If you've seen Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail, that pretty much covers it, okay? It's people in armor riding around and storming castles and yelling insults down at each other and banging on coconuts. But there is a massive revolution going on while this is the norm, and you can see it's all about static positional warfare, long sieges. It is very difficult to make progress in a state-on-state -state war in this time period. Because, for example, the nation of France has hundreds of castles comparable to these. It would take you centuries to potentially conquer it if it's going to take you six or seven or eight months at a time to take a single position. Unless somebody comes along and changes the dynamic. Gunpowder, which had been invented more than a thousand years earlier, but not really weaponized prior to its introduction in Europe, it appears on the battlefields of Europe as early as the 12th century in a very primitive fashion. You feel free to Google this if you don't trust me as the expert. Look up the Tannenberg hand cannon. It's a small bronze tube that knights were actually loading with rudimentary gunpowder and a carved stone ball. You just ram the ball down there. It's about eight inches long. It's mounted on the end of a stick. You would actually ride to battle with this thing hanging off of your breastplate. You've got a lit cord that's been dipped in oil somewhere on your body. That's your match. And whenever you wanted to fire the thing, you had to touch the match to the touch hole in the hand cannon, which would cause an enormously loud explosion. About one out of every three times that you did this, the hand cannon itself would blow up. It was accurate to about five feet, so maybe not revolutionary in that regard, and it'd take you about 15 minutes to reload the thing while other people were swinging spiked clubs and swords and axes and things like that at you. So it's kind of a one-shot deal. But it had the unique ability to penetrate through steel plate armor, and the sound tended to scare the heck out of horses. So even though it was a one-shot deal, it could be fairly effective once in a while. It didn't take long for people to realize that you could build a much larger model. You could fire much larger stones over much greater distances. And as soon as they started to produce artillery, look at what happens to the siege durations. Whereas before, it was taking you 12 months to capture some positions, and those were the successful sieges. There were plenty that failed that took even longer. Now, you're talking a matter of a few days. It turns out, big tall walls don't do well against artillery. So what do you do? 
you completely revolutionize your construction of fortifications. You have a counter-revolution. You start building earthworks. You start building geometric structures that you hope will prevent the enemy from using this new wonder weapon. And you get a fortification revolution that's designed to essentially counter gunpowder. The logical outgrowth, fortifications like this. And you can see there are angles, there are lines, there are trenches. This is considered an almost impenetrable fortification. If you wanted to capture this thing, it would be once again a matter of months or possibly years. So the revolution gets countered, things change. Now this is a revolution. It's considered a quick change. And look how long it took. 200 years. And it's considered a revolution, not an evolutionary change. That's hugely important to us here today. Because cyber warfare and robotic warfare has been around for decades. The change is currently going on. And when we think revolutionary, we think it's got to be snap. You either had it or you didn't. The singularity occurred and everything was different. And they turned on the matrix and we all got locked in. But that's not the case. It actually takes a very long time. You still want to be one of the first adopters of the successful technologies. So, you weren't just using gunpowder in fortifications and the attempts to conquer them. You're also using it in open battles. Because sometimes the enemy just will not conveniently come to where you happen to be you may have to go chase the enemy down. And as they start to incorporate gunpowder hand weapons, they got to figure out how they're going to use these things. The average gunpowder hand weapon in the 1500s takes about three minutes to load. It weighs almost 20 pounds. It's got an effective range of about 50 meters. So, look at me. Go ahead, check it out. We can all agree, I do not have an athlete's body. But I will tell you right now, I can run 50 meters in under three minutes. I can crawl 50 meters in under three minutes. So Gary's going to get one shot at me with that gun. And if he misses, I am going to go running over there and poke him with something pointy or bash him with something heavy. That's going to be a problem. Unless we can figure out some way to incorporate the old technology, long pointy sticks, and the new technology, gunpowder that's available at a distance. Otherwise, it's not going to be very effective. And they struggle with this for centuries. The Spanish come up with a formation they call the tercio. In the middle are pikemen. They're holding spears that are about 20 feet long. On the edges, these are called the horns. These are musketeers. The horns come out, they fire their shots, they retreat back inside the pikes, the pikes come out and hold off anybody that wants to run over and hit me while my musketeers reload. Now I've got range, but I've also got defense. These things might incorporate as many as 5,000 troops in a single formation. They're unwieldy, but they're better than anything anybody had tried before. And for a while, the troops that use the tercio and use it well sweep the battlefields of Europe. Until, and this is the last time you're going to hear somebody say this, the Swedes become a dominant military power. Gustavus Adolphus incorporates some ideas that had been kicked around by a lot of other thinkers, and he comes up with what he calls the brigade. It's also referred to as the Swedish squadron system. You've still got musketeers, you've still got pikes, you've got the incorporation of some light artillery now, but they don't have to work past each other. The idea is those musketeers can retreat behind the pikemen before anything in range can actually come over and schwack them with an unpleasant object. It works really well. And at the Battle of Breitenfeld, we have Swedish squadrons on one side, we have Spanish tercios on the other, and the Swedes sweep the field. They annihilate the enemy. It is an overwhelming victory. At that point, we see that the tercio has become obsolete. The squadron and linear tactics are the new system of the day. Those that adopt it win, those that don't die. Fast forward a few centuries. Since we're here at Cantini, think about the First World War if there wasn't any gunpowder. Gunpowder characterizes most of the weaponry 
used in that conflict. And yet, you look at some of the ludicrous formations that they're using, charging across no man's land, right into the teeth of machine gun teams, with weapons capable of sustained rates of fire of 600 rounds a minute, capable of hitting massed formations at a mile or more. I cannot run a mile. In, well, I probably could just leave it at that. Right? I definitely cannot run a mile in under three minutes. It is impossible to charge against these types of weapons in open ground. You just can't do it. You're going to have to look for some other form of revolutionary technology. Now, to go along with these technological changes, you then get social changes. You get efforts to mitigate some of the worst aspects of this new technology. You get attempts to change the rules of warfare. And sometimes you try to change the rules in order to preserve the current status quo. The major powers want to remain major powers. And so when you get writers like Grotius, like Vattel, like Montesquieu, who are putting together what they consider to be the laws and the norms of warfare, they are doing so under the assumption that the existing power structure will not change. That's still true today. You look at the Geneva Conventions, for example, and they are designed to make sure that the current power structure does not get upset. Look at the structure of the United Nations. There are five permanent members of the Security Council. Now, if you were to design the UN today, would you put the same five on the Security Council, or would you use some different determinant other than was on the right side at the end of World War II as the key component over who's going to get veto power over the use of force? I would humbly suggest that the system would look a little different today. So, you get these attempts to limit what's acceptable in warfare, what kinds of behaviors you're allowed to engage in. And sometimes that's cause for complaint. Within the United States military, we often hear complaints that, hey, we have to follow the Geneva Conventions. And those other guys on the other side, they just do whatever they want. Well, why in the world would Al-Qaeda adhere to the Geneva Conventions? It is a system set up to prevent them from actually obtaining their goals. Of course they're not going to follow that system. They're not going to play by the rules set up by the enemy. I would love to be good at chess. When I was nine years old, I was great at chess. And I'm still really good for a nine-year-old. For a 39-year-old, I'm not so talented, though. And so what I find makes chess far easier for me is if I'm allowed to have twice as many pieces and you only get to move when I tell you it's okay to move. And every once in a while, an airstrike just like wipes out four of your pieces without any notice. Okay? You're not going to sit down at that game. You're not going to agree to play by these rules because they inherently favor me. So we shouldn't be surprised that there are actors trying to upset the entire system. And they're going to try to upset it by any means possible. Now, you also hear the term asymmetrical warfare get thrown around an awful lot. Well, that's asymmetrical warfare. Oh, they're using advantages. Well, you know, I will tell you right now, no commander in the history of the world has ever set out to fight a symmetrical war. Has ever said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make sure that the enemy has just as good a chance of winning as I do. You always fight asymmetrically. You take any advantage that you can. So every war is, to a certain extent, asymmetrical. And that's the goal. I want as many advantages as I can get. Now, the topic that I was assigned is drones, and we'll get to my pet peeves with that term in a moment, hackers, own special issues, and IEDs. And I assume they want me to talk about it in that exact order. So I'm going to do the exact opposite, because you know I'm a wild man, and that's how I roll. A brief history of IEDs. IEDs are improvised explosive devices. They are bombs assembled from components used in a way they were not originally designed. They can be almost anything, and they have been around for a long, long time. They're nothing new. Chinese military manuals from 2,000 years ago were showing the creation of IEDs. This is actually an illustration from one of those. In World War II, the United States started working on one of the weirdest IEDs in history called the Bat Bomb. You're just going to attach incendiaries to a bunch of bats, put them inside a metal casing, 
drop it over a Japanese city, then the bats will naturally go flying looking for a place to roost, and when the timer counts down, the bat and whatever structure it's in catch on fire. Oddly, we didn't follow this up. You've certainly seen some of the IEDs that we've been facing in Iraq and Afghanistan and other locations. They are often just improvised from other forms of explosive weaponry. These are Confederate naval mines. Uh, they're just barrels full of explosives and some form of contact trigger. That's 150 years ago that they're doing this. These are all IEDs. They've been around a really long time. And they're incredibly frustrating because they're the number one killer of American and coalition troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we've tried to come up with every way we can think of to counter these things. Are they revolutionary? Um, to a certain extent, they seem to be. They're changing our entire approach to warfare, but not at the scale that we're seeing with things like gunpowder. Just like we're trying to figure out how to counter them, the enemy is trying to figure out ways to make them more effective. Some of the earliest IEDs that we encountered in Iraq and Afghanistan were simply roadside bombs with a trigger. You drove over it, it blew up. All right, we started to look for those. We started to clear the roads. So then they became command detonated. So we started using jammers to prevent the commands from being reached. So then they started coming up with new triggering mechanisms and we started to up armor our vehicles. So they started to create shaped penetrating charges, which are still phenomenally effective, unfortunately. Our counter systems, we use unmanned aerial vehicles to monitor likely IED spots. And when we see one getting in place, we might very well launch a strike against those people putting it in there. We use jammers inside mobile vehicles to try to shut down the entire cell network and radio transmission frequencies as our convoys are moving through areas. We use up-armored vehicles. This is an Israeli anti-IED bulldozer tank system. Enormous expenditures of money to offset a very technologically simple system that we're trying to deal with here. Is it revolutionary? Uh, maybe, maybe not. But it's definitely changing our approach to war. Cyber. Cyber, I would argue, definitely is revolutionary. Our military has become incredibly dependent upon computerized capabilities. You cannot fly the F-35 without its computer system. It cannot be done. The entire system is computerized. And quite frankly, it turns out, we were very shocked to discover, it is at least theoretically possible to hack an F-35 jet. That does not mean you take it over and you fly it around and you play Microsoft Flight Simulator. It does mean you could shut down the control systems and crash it. So that's a bit of a flaw, and maybe we'll try to fix that before we field it. Computers are tied into everything now. You all know this. How many of you have some form of wireless device with you right now? You see, look around the room, because there's a few people playing on them, and they didn't even hear the question, right? <laughs> you know, me too. I'm in. I'm in. Lunch? Is that, did he ask for lunch? They're everywhere. You can't get away from them. You can't, you, you, you can't live without them at this point, it seems like. I mean, a lot of you are teaching teenagers, right? You know where this is going. How many of those teenagers do you think, if it was an option, would volunteer to have a cell phone surgically implanted in their brain? <laughs> think about it, right? But that's, that's way off. That's at least 2018 before that happens. They'll graduate before that happens. That's where we're headed. We're incorporating this technology so much into our lives now that we're starting to incorporate it into ourselves. And there's a bit of a red herring when it comes to computers. The notion of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence, you can't tell that you're talking to a computer instead of a human being. There is almost no compelling reason to pursue artificial intelligence. There's no point to creating an artificial human other than, I don't know, because you want to, or that other component, sex bots. But that one doesn't have to be smart, apparently. Look it up on Google, but not maybe in a work environment. Uh, so, Alan Turing, on the left there, he's the guy that came up with what was called the Turing test. And this was the artificial intelligence test, that effectively you communicate with a computer and a human being through some kind of a mechanism so you can't tell which is which just on the sound of their voice, maybe through a typing system. 
You ask questions to both of them, and if you can't determine which one's the human, then you can consider the computer to be artificially intelligent. But here's the thing, what's the point? What you need are specialized computers. Computers are way better than we are at a lot of functions. Right? Think about a simple calculator. How fast can you calculate the square root of 3,194? Well, if you've got a calculator, it doesn't take long at all. If you don't, then uh, you know, work your way through it, think it through, all right, I carry the two, and I do all that stuff. Okay? What we want is specialized intelligence. And when it comes to military technology, that is certainly true. So it's a bit of a red herring when you hear people talking about the singularity, uh, which is something that Mike mentioned yesterday, the idea that at a certain point in the future, computers will become smarter than we are. Well, they already are, but only in certain very specialized tasks. There are a lot of things that humans are way better at. Judgment calls and, you know, I mean, sensory perception type stuff, we're really good at. Uh, not so good necessarily at balancing our checkbooks, but it's a bit of a trade-off. Now, there are certain things in the military that computers do that we can't dream of doing. So you look at these systems down here. This is a close-in weapon system. It is designed to track and fire on incoming projectiles or incoming aircraft that are a threat to naval vessels. You define the parameters of what a threat is and you turn the system on because human beings cannot track inbound projectiles and pull the trigger fast enough to actually shoot them down. This is not skeet shooting. All right, We were bad at that in World War II. We were bad at it in World War II. We were so bad at it in World War II that when we started facing kamikazes, we told our gunners to stop shooting at them. And instead we said, all right, this is your sector of fire. Your job is to just hose it down with bullets. And everybody else will have a sector too, and then we'll just hope that these Japanese guys fly into the bullets. And that actually worked really well, comparatively speaking. But humans can't track inbound mortar rounds, inbound cruise missiles. Only a computer can calculate that and make it happen. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the Patriot missile battery, which did great work all the way back in 1991, shooting down Scud missiles. Now, I want you to imagine a human being trying to track that missile and fire the shot. It's not going to happen. So this specialized intelligence is a really good thing. But there are dangers to it as well. Because the more information that we turn over to computers and put under their management, the more fungible that data becomes. Data can be changed, it can be altered, it can be deleted. You've all lost files that you desperately needed. It happens to all of us sometimes. And the more information that we put into an accessible area for computers to reach, the more likely you are to have other computers and other actors interfering with that data. The number one example of that principle right now is housed in this building right here. The Chinese People's Liberation Army Unit uh, 61398. Basically, it's their hacking core. Their entire job is to launch cyber attacks. And they work nine to five. It's the weirdest thing in the world. DOD networks get attacked from nine to five Beijing time. And the number of attacks that we face every day then drops, just plummets as soon as it's time to bail out and go home. And we know then, 16 hours later, they're going to be right back at it, hacking away at us again. We face tens of thousands of cyber intrusion attempts every single day, and that's just the DOD. And these guys do not limit themselves to attacking the United States and the United States military. They go after any data they can grab. They go after contractors. They go after businesses. They go after banks. They go after individuals. That's their job. And they're really really good at it. Unfortunately, right now, the United States cyber capability is considered number six in the world. We're not number one. We're not even close. We are currently tied with Iran and Poland in terms of our cyber capability. We are far behind the Russians, the Chinese, the Israelis, the Estonians, surprise entry there, uh, you know, this is, this is our new reality, that we have fallen behind. We have kind of ceded the lead on this. And if they're the earliest adopters, and they're the ones that have effectively said it's fair game to attack anywhere, anytime, anyone, for any reason, to grab up any information you can and use it however you want, then the rules of the game 
are clearly different than the way that we might wish they were or assume they are in terms of acceptable behavior in wartime. Now, we tend to function under the assumption that in wartime, there are legitimate targets and there are illegitimate targets. People in uniform, fair game. People just driving down the street, back on the home front, not fair game. The Chinese do not see it that way. They are convinced that in the event of a conventional engagement with the United States, they will not win unless they use their asymmetric advantages. And that's going to include things like attacking our power plant systems, so trying to shut down electrical generating capability for the entire United States, attacking our infrastructure. Imagine what happens if every street light in New York turns green at the same time. Attacking any form of data storage that we've got. Imagine what happens if the credit card companies lose any idea of how much you have or haven't spent, or worse still, lose the ability to process payments. How long could you survive today based only on the cash that you have on you? Since none of you live here, how long would you make it? For most people, the answer is a couple days. A couple days with the cash they've got, because most people just don't carry a lot of cash around. We assume that our networks will always work. We assume that our card is always good. Well, that may not be true if we get into a tussle with a country that sees itself as having a significant advantage in the cyber realm. And so it's something that we always have to think about in terms of conflict. They are not going to limit themselves to the kind of conflict that we want to fight. And if we aren't aware of that, and if our students aren't aware of that going forward, they're going to have a very nasty surprise at some point in the future. Conflict, I, I would argue human conflict is inevitable. And so you've got to accept the existence of conflict and do the best you can to develop as many advantages as you can. Now, speaking of advantages, we've talked about nuclear weapons. Jim did a great job of laying out his concepts for where, why he thinks that proliferation is, is falling and the number of warheads aren't out there. I would say the number one reason that proliferation has been curtailed is the state of Israel, which does not tolerate nuclear neighbors. In 1983, or excuse me, 1981, they attacked the Iraqi nuclear reactor at Osirak. Hit it with an airstrike, wiped it out, Iraq gave up its nuclear ambitions because they were pretty sure the Israelis would just come back if they ever tried to do it again. One you may or may not have heard about is 2007. In Operation Orchard, the Israelis launched an airstrike against Syria where there may or may not have been a reactor. You ask the Syrians, there wasn't. You ask the IAEA, there totally was. Uh, the, the International Atomic Energy uh, Administration, they, they were not allowed into the site for about three months after the strike. When they got there, they found that everything had been bulldozed and cleaned. And so it was just an empty ground. And the Syrians said, see, we, we didn't have anything here. There's nothing to worry about. At which point they then pulled out their Geiger counters and went, eh, we're worried. You know, look at that. They're pinging. What you might not know is that the Israelis launched a massive cyber attack the night of that airstrike. They actually used a computer attack to seize control of the Syrian air defense radars. They shut down the entire Syrian air defense system without the Syrians even knowing they had been penetrated. The first news the Syrians had that they were under attack was when bombs started going off in their development system. The Israelis were in and out without the Syrians even knowing what had happened. The Syrians were hugely embarrassed by this. They've tried to correct the security flaws, uh, but it turns out they've been a little busy with other things lately, so they haven't been able to fix everything. I bring that up because you may have heard the term Stuxnet before. The Iranians may or may not be trying to develop nuclear weapons at Natanz. That is a much farther away target for the Israelis, and even though the Israelis did an air training mission across the western Mediterranean to the exact distance that it would take to reach Natanz with an airstrike, uh, message received, the Israelis are not sure that it's a good idea to fly across Iraqi airspace to reach Iran. So, we don't know, or at least we're not allowed to say, exactly who was responsible for Stuxnet, but we do know what it was and we do know how it worked. It was a virus, a very targeted cyber attack designed to exploit a weakness in a single type 
of control unit computer that ran nuclear centrifuges. It takes advantage of a system flaw and it inserts just a little bit of code. The way it's supposed to work is shown up here and you don't have to worry about the acronyms, you don't really care. Uh, what you want is just to see that there's a little bonus bit of code inserted there that changes the speed at which the centrifuges turn. Now, as Americans, we have a certain familiarity with technology, something that a lot of Iranians really don't, and Stuxnet took advantage of that fact. If you're driving down the road, you know what your car's engine sounds like when it's performing normally. When the pitch of the car's engine changes, it's suddenly much higher, you think to yourself, huh, that's not right. You may not know what the issue is, but you know there is an issue. And so you tend to take it in for service. And you say, well, I don't know, it's making this weird noise. And the mechanics who get paid an enormous amount of money go, eh, we'll figure it out, don't worry, we got it under control. They know well enough to diagnose what the issue is. But you at least know there's a problem. The engineers working in Natanz did not detect a problem even though the pitch of the machines that were spinning day and night changed. They were running at a different RPM, so they sounded differently, but they didn't have enough technological familiarity to realize machines aren't supposed to do that. It should sound the same all the time while it's running. Stuxnet required months, months to be effective. This wasn't a change the RPMs one time and boom, system shuts down. The only way it works is to rev up the RPMs and then drop it really low and then rev it up again and then drop it really low. Over a period of months, this actually induces a flaw in the centrifuge and causes it to spin out of control and destroy itself. It is a temporary setback. It's not as effective as bombing, maybe, uh, but at least temporarily it set back the Iranian nuclear ambitions and it demonstrated how effective a very targeted cyber attack could be. Now, interesting side note, because we love anecdotes and because I'm the last one, so I guess I can just talk to like five today. Interesting side note, we're pretty sure Stuxnet was distributed on flash drives, those little USB drives. And we're pretty sure what happened was some human agents in the area had Stuxnet on flash drives and just dropped them in the parking lots near the facility. Because people are helpful. They walk along and they go, oh, there's a flash drive. Somebody dropped it. Oh, it's got a lanyard that says Iranian nuclear reactor program. So clearly it's one of ours. I'll pick it up. I'll take it inside. I'll plug it into my computer and figure out who it belongs to. It was a closed cyber system. It was not connected to the internet. But the moment somebody plugged in that flash drive, it instantly uploaded Stuxnet, penetrated through all of the systems. Now it turns out, Stuxnet is actually found on more than 60% of all personally owned computers in Norway because it propagates itself without any concern for the systems that it's going into. It's designed to spread as much as it can. And it doesn't matter. You don't have one of those systems at your home in Norway, so you've got nothing to worry about. But if you are spinning a centrifuge in Norway, you really need to run your antivirus programs. Okay. Let's throw some definitions about robotics out there because this is the revolution that brings it all together for me. A drone. A drone is a machine that just performs a pre-programmed function. A drone is also the term that the military absolutely loathes. We have drones and we use them. We use them for target practice and occasionally we use them for reconnaissance. But it's not what the media calls a drone. When the media refers to drone strikes, that just causes our, you know, our hackles to get up a little bit. We just don't like that very much. It's very frustrating. It turns out you cannot get the media to change the use of that term. It doesn't matter how much you educate them, they love it. So for the purposes of the rest of this talk, I'll probably accidentally use drones. And you can make fun of me for it in the Q&A if you want. A robotic system is a machine that has a limited degree of being able to sense its environment and respond to changes in the environment make decisions based on its own perceptions. But it's under the command and control of a human operator. Somebody has to turn it on, somebody has to tell it what to do, somebody has to pull the trigger. So this little scary beast down here is called a Talon Swords. That is about a 200 pound tracked robot. It is remotely operable. You can arm that thing with grenade launchers, missile launchers, fully automatic firearms. 
or cameras and bomb disposal equipment, you know, whatever you want. It's a great platform if you have a human driving it because I don't know if there's any competitive shooters in here, but the greatest source of error in competitive long-range shooting is just simply human biology. You're breathing, you have a pulse. That's enough to throw shots off over great distances. The longest human-fired sniping shot, kill shot in history is about a mile and a half. About a mile and a half out, a British sniper killed someone in Afghanistan using a 50 caliber rifle at about a mile and a half. This little beast can sh send shots downrange in a three inch cluster two miles out. Because it just does things better. It calculates windage better. It's integrated with its own laser targeting system. Now it's a human that's looking through the view screen and saying, yeah, take that shot. But the machine is phenomenally capable, and that's that enhanced intelligence for you. It's really good at the job that it's created for. You've all, I'm sure, seen the Predator, which started out as a surveillance platform, but in 2002 it became weaponized when they decided that one of the big problems with using Predators was while they could loiter around and look at stuff and track things, it took too long to bring some form of kinetic weaponry to the area to launch any kind of an attack to follow up on whatever it was looking at. So they said, all right, well, let's take this Hellfire missile that we've already got, strap it to the bottom of this thing, and see if we can make it work. And the answer was yes. We tried some other crazy approaches to this. Uh, if you guys have ever heard of Stinger missiles, these are the anti-aircraft missiles that we gave to the Mujahideen, and now we kind of wonder where they are. We tried strapping some of those onto Predators and using them in air-to-air -air combat just to see what would happen. Uh, we actually tried that against an Iraqi MiG jet during Operation Northern Watch. It did not go well for the Predator. Uh, it's flying at 80 miles an hour when it fires an anti-aircraft missile at the Iraqi jet, which just kind of swerves and then shoots it down. So score one for the humans, yay us. The revolution is on. All right, robots. Robots are freely operating machines. They have to be capable of some degree of sensing and interacting with their environment. That does not mean that they have to be able to smell or hear or see in the same ways that we might think about it, but they have to be able to actually make independent decisions based on the stimuli around them. If they can't do that, they're not a robot. And so I've thrown some examples of popular culture robots up there. Uh, some of them more popular than others, just to you know, stimulate your mind and get you some idea of what we're talking about here. Final piece of the puzzle, cyborgs. Cyborgs are cybernetic organ organisms. Basically, living tissue with some form of electromechanical augmentation. Rush Limbaugh is a cyborg. No joke. He had a cochlear implant put in that allows him to hear and continue to bring his broadcast program to all of America. He's one of more than a million cyborgs in the United States today. There are an enormous number of advances in terms of cybernetics these days, and that's a positive use for the most part. But there's nothing to necessarily stop people from trying to enhance themselves with what you might call cybernetic upgrades. Now, in the case of this individual, he lost his eye as in a childhood accident. He's actually a professor and he wanted to do an experiment, so he had a camera implanted in his eye socket that records and wirelessly broadcasts everything he sees. And it's this kind of bizarre human experiment about what we perceive and what we don't. A different professor, I don't know why it's always professors, but it is, a different one had a camera implanted in the back of his skull to have an eye in the back of his head to show everything that was behind him. Weird, in my opinion, but in his particular case, he's not a cyborg. He's got a camera strapped into his eye socket, but it's not actually tied into his body in any way, shape, or form. He might as well just be carrying a camera around. However, there have now been six patients in the United States that have had a special implant put into their eyes to allow them to renew their eyesight. They had lost it to a degen degenerative disease. And this particular device essentially bypasses the cornea and directly stimulates the retina with light to bring back a limited degree of sight for them. It's not sight like we consider sight. 
Although, you know, we're all getting a little older, so some of us have worse sight than others. Uh, is it Lenny, you still back there? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, in this particular case, we're seeing some significant enhancements, and that's a good thing. But if you want to go down the pessimist side of things, imagine military service requiring you to accept cybernetic upgrades as part of your service. Sounds far-fetched, right? And it is, unless somebody else does it. Because if our troops are suddenly far less capable than anybody they're facing in the field, if the enemy has a massive advantage, you will either adapt or you will die. Those are your choices in these revolutionary changes. That's right, you wanted me to leave this on a high note, didn't you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, where we were with military robotics, we've been doing this a long time. Robotic systems have been around a lot longer than most people realize. In 1918, we had the Kettering Bug. And that thing is a flying bomb. It was pretty much pre-programmed to just fly over enemy trenches and crash. Uh, we never actually fielded the thing because it didn't get built soon enough to actually put it into production. You have the Goliath, the best misnamed tank of World War II. The Goliath is actually a remotely driven anti-tank mine. The goal is to just drive it under enemy tanks and blow them up. This is very similar to the Russian system of strapping anti-tank mines to dogs and training them to run at enemy tanks. It's true. You know, feel free to look that up. Uh, at the end of the war, as you can see, there were a lot of Goliaths left. They didn't work very well because they were not wireless. They actually had to unspool wire behind them, which turned out to be a pretty significant vulnerability. You're probably familiar with the V-1 flying bomb. You might be familiar with the V-2. This is the Soviet teletank. The teletank is a remotely operated radio-controlled tank. The Soviets in World War II are actually trying to create swarms of these things. And the idea is you have one human crew in a tank, and all the other tanks just do the same thing that that tank does. So when they fire, you know, when, the, when the humans fire, all of the, the remotely operated tanks fire as well. They tried to employ these things against the Finns in the Winter War. As you might imagine, it went horrifically bad. They actually wound up shooting most of their own teletanks with the human-operated crews to avoid them being captured by the enemy. Disastrously bad idea. But when you're on the cutting edge, sometimes you're going to make mistakes. Here we see some of the more recent advancements. The Teledyne Ryan Fire Bee was originally a target drone until somebody had the bright idea to strap essentially a TV camera onto it and start flying it over very, very defended areas in the Vietnam War. You could send this thing on recon missions where you would not send manned aircraft. It would fly the pre-programmed route, it would come back, you could recover it, you could launch it again. A lot of them got shot down. One of them managed to make it through about 70 missions before it finally got shot down. We started flying those over China, we started flying them over Vietnam, we considered flying them over the Soviet Union. By the 1980s, we're playing around with a precursor to the Predator. This is the Pioneer. It's similar to the Predator, it's almost like a remotely controlled airplane that you might see from a hobbyist with a camera attached to it, pretty slow, it can loiter for a long time. It had become completely obsolete by 2003. So when we decided we were going to go to war against Iraq in 2003, we took all the pioneers we had left, we stuck a bunch of squawk boxes on them so that they would have enormous radar signatures, and then we just flew them over Iraq just to see what would happen. And the Iraqi air defenses lit up and we went, oh, that's where all their radars are. So they're attacking our pioneers, and they're so bad at air defense by 2003 that some of the pioneers actually cleared Iraqi airspace, had to be crashed by their operators so they wouldn't penetrate into Syria. But immediately following behind them were stealthy aircraft that then attacked the radar sites and wiped out the Iraqi air defenses. That's, that's just recycling. That's just good stuff, right? You don't want to waste any of these assets. Kevin Warwick down there, Kevin, oops. Kevin Warwick is a, uh, a British professor, always a professor, who decided to essentially put electrodes in his wrist that then allowed him, once they mapped the correct frequencies, to wirelessly control this robotic hand. Making it a little creepier, after they'd done that for a while, Kevin's wife then had an electrode put into her wrist that allowed them to wirelessly control each other's hands. Creepy. Right? But it turns out if you induce the right amount of current on a nerve, then that will cause your fingers to move independently of whether your mind wants them to move or not. What made it interesting to Warwick 
was that he could feel what his wife was doing. So his wife could actually signal him through their thoughts. That was back in 2000. We're making a lot of progress since then. Where we are now, you've got the Reaper, which carries 14 times the payload of the Predator. You've got the counter-rocket artillery mortar. This is a close-in weapon system capable of engaging 60 millimeter mortar rounds that are inbound. You have the Atlas robot, which Mike showed you some of that yesterday. This gentleman has been connected to a cybernetic hand. He is controlling that with his mind. In two th early 2014, they actually implanted it onto his forearm. He can now control an artificial hand using his mind. He doesn't have to retrain his muscles. It's all wired directly into his nervous system. That's great. It's good that we can do that. But now you want to imagine that that hand is 10 times stronger than a human hand. And suddenly it becomes a tremendous advantage. Iron Dome is the Israeli air defense system brought online in 2011. It has been phenomenally successful at shooting down projectiles that are headed towards occupied areas and ignoring projectiles that are going to land in an empty field. And then, of course, you saw the big dog. I had no idea Mike was going to have so many cool photos. I'll get revenge on him somehow. Where we're going. Exoskeletons. This man is a paraplegic. The exoskeleton that he's wearing allows him to move around slowly and clumsily, but it's still pretty impressive. This man is wearing a mind-controlled prosthetic leg. It reacts to signals from his brain. The Talon swords, right now they're under the control of human operators, but there's no reason that they inherently have to be. You can actually create an autonomous system with them if you wanted to. I'm praying we don't. And then there's the ones that scare me. Hitachi has come up with a facial recognition system that can compare 30 million faces per second. It can compare the entire Earth's population to a single photo in a matter of a few minutes. And it can do so at about a 30 to 45 degree angle. It doesn't even need the front on shot. It does not need a complete shot of your face to make those comparisons. What happens if you pair that up with a low cast system? Mike told you yesterday that we've never developed autonomous killing machines, but he's wrong. We chose not to field the low cast. With the low cast, you launch it, you tell it what the enemy looks like, and it chooses whether to fire or not. No human in the loop. It fires three submunitions, then turns itself into a kamikaze for a fourth strike. Now, what do you think happens if you pair a low cast with a facial recognition system like this? And by the way, the low cast can loiter over a city for about 18 hours. So imagine that you just go, all right, you're going to go get Mike. This Mike, not the one that left. Maybe we should go with Mike Horowitz. If I know what city he's in and he comes outside, I launch a handful of these over the city, I have a reasonable chance of getting him. And maybe anybody else that's standing next to him, because I can just assume they're all bad operators, right? If they're friends with Mike, they're on the kill list. All right, so where we're going, Centibots. This is actually created at the MIT robotic system. A hundred of these little bots can map an entire city of about 100,000 people in under five days and their programming is enormously simple. Keep moving, stay away from other centibots, report what you see. That's it. They can't just map the streets. Theoretically, they can actually map every single structure and every single room in those structures of a city of 100,000. Obviously, there's limits. You close a door, <laughs> whole system's wrecked. Tactical microbots, these things have already been developed. If you want to find out who's inside a room, just fly this little camera in there and look at the handheld device and see who's inside. Pretty simple. And those can be made autonomous with the same type of programming. Just fly around. Eventually you'll see something I want you to see. You saw the micro swarms that he showed you yesterday? Where we're going. Where we're going. I have one final case study for you here. This is my pièce de résistance. How many of you have heard of Anwar al-Awlaki? All right, sizable number, that's good. al was born in the United States. He's an American citizen, and he was a horrible person. Uh, that is my opinion, but in this particular case, that is also the opinion of the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, the Air Command and Staff College. I mean, we all agreed that al bad, bad operator. He was the ideological leader, though not the tactical commander, of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. 
He spent a lot of time trying to inspire people to launch attacks on the United States. But he's an American citizen. And that makes him a special challenge. Even though he decided to go to Yemen in 2004, and that's where he was doing all of his inspirational activities, still an American citizen. So, get some idea of what al Awlaki was doing over there in Yemen. You've probably heard of Nidal Hassan, the first Fort Hood shooter. The two of them had a series of conversations back and forth on Gmail. Interestingly enough, al Awlaki never actually told Hassan to launch an attack. Hassan contacted al Awlaki and asked him whether it was acceptable in Islam to use violence. Awlaki actually counseled him to seek inner peace, not to pick up a weapon and start shooting other military officers at Fort Hood. You probably remember the underwear bomber. He, too, was inspired by Awlaki. Faisal Shazad was the radiologist who decided that it would be a good idea to load his car full of explosives and detonate it in Times Square. Mohammed Mohammed, 15-year-old kid that tried to blow up a Christmas tree lighting ceremony in Portland, Oregon. These three individuals were all directly involved in 9-11. All of them were connected to al -Laki. But With friends like these, he's probably a pretty nasty guy. And al was the one that came up with the idea of doing fifth column attacks. Those are attacks launched from within the United States by people that basically just decide to take up jihad and attack anything they can. al was the guy that came up with that idea. Bad person. Still an American citizen. So, we start tracking al -Laki. We are doing our best to chase this guy down. We would love to capture him. We would love to put him on trial. We would love to try him with treason against the United States. But then we decide that we're not going to be able to get him. It's too dangerous in Yemen to send forces in. We don't have a, a force agreement with Yemen that would allow us to send in special forces to capture him. It's just not safe. And so he gets put on what's often referred to as the kill list. The Treasury Department maintains a special list of specially designated global terrorists. And you can look it up, it's actually online. It's readily available. You can see everybody that's ever been put on there and why, when they were put on there, if they were taken off. Yeah, that's a great way to spend a Sunday afternoon. So, al gets put on there. And his father files a lawsuit to try to get him removed on the grounds that he is A, an American citizen, and B, has not done anything illegal. I don't want to get into the legalities of whether what he did was, was legal or not, uh, but that was the argument that his father was making. And the federal government's response was, the only person that can file a lawsuit to remove him from the list is al -Laki. So he needs to come to a federal courthouse and file this lawsuit, and then we'll consider his case. Of course, we're going to grab him the moment he does that, but I'm sorry, your case is going to be dropped. The federal government asks YouTube to remove a bunch of his preaching videos. Uh, they comply with removing some, but not all of them. You can still see some of his sermons on YouTube if you're into that sort of thing. He gets charged in Yemen with murder in absentia, because even though he's in Yemen, the Yemenis don't know exactly where he is. A Yemeni judge issues a dead or alive order on al Awlaki to Yemeni forces. His lawsuit gets dismissed in December. In May of 2011, a predator fires some hellfires at a car we thought was carrying al -Laki. Turns out al -Laki and his confederates had noticed the predator up in the sky. They pulled underneath some trees. They changed cars. So the two guys that were killed were a couple of his subordinates, but not him. But we continued to track him. And in September, we traced him down. He and his friends stopped to have some breakfast on the side of the road. Predator fired two hellfire missiles striking the vehicle, killing all of its occupants, including Samir Khan, also an American citizen. So the U.S. military has now just been used to execute two American citizens. You may or may not have a problem with that. I would argue that the Constitution has a problem with that. Article 3 is pretty clear about what treason is, levying war against the United States. I can make an argument al Awlaki was guilty of that, no problem. But it requires a court, testimony of witnesses, or a confession. 
You don't get to execute people without a trial. You do get to kill people without a trial in war, but I'm not sure that you're allowed to do that with American citizens. Very difficult problem for us. And I want you to keep in mind here, it says, no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood. Basically, if I'm guilty of, of treason, my kids don't get punished. Just me. Keep that in the back of your mind. It's going to be important in a moment. Okay. Fifth Amendment, you are entitled to trial. You've got to be indicted by a grand jury. You cannot be held responsible for a capital case without a trial. Sixth Amendment, speedy and public trial. Confronted with witnesses, assistance of counsel. None of these apply in Al Lockheed's case. Instead, we executed an American citizen because it was too difficult to capture him. We did so without any judicial oversight whatsoever. You have to have judicial oversight to establish wiretapping, but apparently you don't to kill people. And it's a big deal. It set Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula back a lot. It was very effective in that regard. So from a military utility standpoint, this was great. But I'm not sure that it really conforms with what it means to be an American, with American values. And that's the problem that I have with it. I have another problem with it, though, and it's this guy. Abdul Rahman al Awlaki, his 16-year-old kid. Abdul Rahman hadn't seen his father in five years when his father was killed. He went to Yemen to live with relatives to try to find his father. And when that wasn't working, he heard rumors of where his father might be. So like any 16-year-old, he doesn't listen to the family when they tell him not to do something. He actually steals the equivalent of $40 from his aunt and hops on a bus to go to the town where he has heard his father is. What he doesn't know, because it hasn't been announced yet, is that his father's already been killed in a predator strike a few days earlier. He leaves a note behind for his family. Family wakes up, they see the note. They call other family members in the town that Abdul Rahman is headed to, and they say, hey, 16-year-old idiot's on a bus. Can you grab him, please? He's looking for his father. He's not going to find him. Can you watch out for him? He can't be running loose like this. So the family says, yeah, no problem. We'll, we'll hang on to him here for a couple weeks, let him hang out with his cousins, get to know this branch of the family, and then we'll send him back. He has a great time. Like any teenager, he's taking all kinds of cell phone photos and posting them to Facebook of all the fun things that he's doing with his cousins and all of his friends. They're having a great barbecue on October 14th, 2011. Hanging out by a campfire, Abdul Rahman is headed home the next day until a Predator fires two Hellfire missiles and a 500-pound bomb gets dropped on their campfire. Nine teenagers get executed, and we can't even tell the body parts apart. They have to get buried together because, for all intents and purposes, they're annihilated. Why? Well, that's the, the million-dollar question. When the federal government gets challenged on this and they're asked, hey, why did you kill this 16-year-old kid? The response is, he was a 21-year-old jihadi who had taken up arms against the Yemeni government and the United States. He was an Al-Qaeda operative. And the family went, well, no. Here's his birth certificate. He's a 16-year-old kid from Denver. So then, the federal government says, well, we don't really have to answer this, but we're going to. He was meeting with Ibrahim Albana, really nasty Egyptian major important player in Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And the family said, no, actually, here's the cell phone po posts that he posted to Facebook the day he was killed. Albana wasn't within 200 miles of that campfire. And that's the danger of the military robotics path that we've headed down. It has become so tempting to use force because we can do so with impunity. Now we can launch strikes and there's no possibility of retaliation. Now we can hit and never get hit back, or at least that's the presumption. But it's not going to be the case for very long. And the problem is you're blurring the lines for what's acceptable military behavior. You're changing the rules of the game. Should American military personnel flying a predator out of Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada 
be considered legitimate targets of war. They're in uniform, they're engaged in acts of war. Is it okay if a foreign agent were to break onto Nellis and kill them? Would that be a legal act of war? Yes, under certain circumstances. But do you really want them to become legitimate targets when they're stopping by the store to pick up a gallon of milk on the way home after fighting their eight-hour shift in the war? I don't think that's a line that we want to blur a whole lot here. We can set the standards for acceptable behavior. My final contention is that we are currently instead rushing down the path of embracing every technological innovation without giving much thought to what it means to use it, to what the ethics, the morality, the legality is or should be. I think that we are diving into the deep end of the pool and we haven't given a thought as to how we're going to swim. Now, thanks to Mike Horowitz yesterday, it is now cliched to have a picture of Terminators at the end, uh, but I didn't have a way to change that before this, so it was supposed to be an awesome finish. And instead, it's just the end. But I am open to your questions. Anything you want to throw at me, I'm wide open. Okay, we'll give the first question to Gary Morris. Before you say anything, remember, I have a laser pointer, and I am not afraid to use it. <laughs> Go for it. Um, really wonderful presentation, uh, but my question is this. You talk about the fact that we are heading down this very slippery slope of indiscriminate killing. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there any way for us to walk back from that ledge that we're walking down now and how could that be done? Yes, there is. Just because you create a weapon doesn't mean you have to use it. I mean, there are a lot of examples of that that have never been used in warfare before. All kinds of horrific nerve agents, uh, all kinds of advanced nuclear weapons. I mean, after all, we've only used nuclear weapons in war in 1945. Think about how much bigger and nastier they are now. So it is possible to have a global consensus to just not do certain really bad things. And there is a movement right now to ban, before they're fielded, autonomous weapons. Autonomous weapons are the weapons that don't have a human being in the loop. This is the same point that Mike was making yesterday when he said there should always be a human in the loop. It's exactly what he's talking about. If you formally ban that type of weapon before somebody uses it, then there's no proof of the significant advantage that it conveys. Does that mean nobody will try to use one? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that you then have global condemnation on your side, which can be a really important thing. Or in the case of Syria, it apparently can be completely irrelevant. You know, there is no great perfect answer. But what I would say is we should guide ourselves by our own principles. I don't think that this is a good thing I don't think that it, it, it fits well with what it means to be an American, with how we go about our interactions in the world. And I think that the United States has shown leadership on a lot of weapons systems where we've actually tried to reduce things like nuclear stockpiles, where we are unilaterally reducing our stockpiles and hoping other people go along with us. To me, autonomous military robotics, they are just a horrifically bad idea that somebody is likely to do unless there's a consensus that nobody will do it. Because weak non-state actors are not going to be able to develop these types of weapons. These are major world hegemonic power weapons. This is not something that proliferates. And if you all agree not to develop them and not to build them and not to field them, they're not going to filter down to those non-state actors. On the other hand, RPAs, those things, remotely piloted aircraft, those are being flown by Hezbollah right now. Hezbollah has used Iranian models of RPAs against the Israelis, including armed variants. You know, that level of stuff filters down in part because it's really easy to make. You want to make an armed RPA, go to the local hobby shop. You know, go buy yourself a fairly large remotely controlled plane and then think of anything that might explode that you can attach to it. There's a lot of ways that you can make that thing unpleasant. So, you know, these, on the other hand, way more sophisticated. You won't build these in your own garage. Uh, final question, Mike. <laughs> yes, sir. I was wondering 
What measures are we taking to retaliate against Chinese hackers? And why are we on the defense? Why are we not on the offense and hacking them? There are a couple different schools of thought on that. Uh, one is that we're doing it just as much as they are. Uh, we're just maybe not as public about it. You know, is the NSA and Cyber Command doing all kinds of offensive activity that we don't know about? Well, they might be. I mean, after all, <laughs> thanks, Ed Snowden, for letting us know that they're listening in right now. You know, everybody wave at the NSA. Uh, so it could be that we're actually doing the same stuff, although they, the Chinese have created their own, basically, corner of the Internet that they are capable of cutting off from the global commons at any time. Uh, we do not have that capability. We're nowhere near that capability. We're, we are so tied into the internet that we couldn't cut ourselves off if we tried. So we may be doing it as well. The other school of thought is that by not doing it, you don't reveal your capabilities. If the United States was responsible for Stuxnet, I don't know, and I'm not confirming one way or the other, but the United States has the capability to do something like Stuxnet. If we were responsible for something like Stuxnet, it came as a major surprise because you didn't tip your hand to what you could and couldn't do. And it could be that we're effectively trying to get the Chinese to show us how capable they are or are not at this kind of penetration. The problem, though, is not really the DOD. The DOD is doing a pretty good job of defending itself and keeping them out of, of most of our, our really important networks. We have multiple layers of networks, uh, and, and they've been, been very irritating at the unclassified level, uh, but on the classified network, they're, they're pretty, pretty much secure from that. Uh, but they're also, because they're going after businesses and they're going after patent applications and they're going after individual emails and bank accounts and all this sort of thing, you know, imagine what happens if a state-sponsored organization decides to engage in identity theft of as many Americans as they've scooped up data on. You know, think about the target breach, uh, you know, a target corporation loses 100 million users' credit card information, right? Now imagine the Chinese government going, all right, you know what we're going to do? We're going to start racking up charges on every single one of those credit cards just to screw with the Americans. How long will it take us to untangle that mess if it's not a small group of rogue hackers, but rather an entire state-sponsored effort? And the Chinese are really putting a lot of effort into blending the, the asymmetrical advantages they have with attacks on civilian infrastructure that they're going to argue it's not war. They're going to argue it's not war because it's only data that you're destroying. It's only information you're messing with. And if anybody dies, that's a secondary collateral damage kind of a thing. You don't kill somebody with a computer. But if you shut down the entire power grid of the United States, you're going to kill a lot of people. There's a lot of people that are entirely dependent upon it to keep themselves alive, and there's going to be all kinds of secondary effects. And so is it an act of war? Uh, we've been deliberately ambiguous on where the cyber threshold is. We have said that we are willing to retaliate for cyber intrusions and attacks using kinetic effects. Effectively, we are willing to bomb you for launching hacking attacks on us, but we won't tell you exactly where that red line is in the hopes that uh, nobody will push us that far. So hope that answers your question well enough. Thank you, uh, Paul Springer.